Welcome to my YouTube channel. My guest on Facing the Canon is Rick Thorpe, Bishop of Islington. Rick Thorpe, welcome to Facing the Canon. Thank you, it's great to be here, John. We've known each other a long time. And we first met when I was invited to lead a mission at Birmingham University, and you were on the committee. I was, I was the treasurer of the committee and the events organizer. And um, I got to know you just briefly, but then during the mission particularly, we spent a lot of time together. And that was Absolutely. an amazing time. Were you brought up as a Christian? So my parents were churchgoers and I used I was very used to going to church. I used to, I remember getting dressed to, to you know really smartly to go to church and I, I believed in God. I believed in Jesus. I believed in the facts of the Christian faith, but it was like something here, but it wasn't in my heart at all. I don't think anyone had actually told me you, there's a decision to make. There's a, an invitation to receive. And so um, I, when I went to Birmingham University, uh, I was invited by actually um, a friend who became the chair of the mission committee, Tim Stilwell, um, and a, a, some called Philippa Stroud now, um, and they invited me to church. And I um, heard the gospel preached by a guy called Nick Cuthbert, who's uh, an evangelist yes, in Birmingham. He, and he, good friend. Yeah, and he invited people to make a decision. So he said, if you want to respond to Jesus, if you want to respond to his invitation to follow him, put your hand up. And my hand shot up like this. I said, I want to follow him. And he said, at the end of the uh, session, they're going to have a hymn. And if you want to make that commitment, come and uh, come to the back room at the, during the last verse of this hymn. And so I went forwards and um, that decision, it was, uh, it was like inked in. So for me, it was you know speaking to someone else about it and saying, I want to follow him. This person prayed for me and then invited me to um, meet with him every morning for the next three weeks at seven o'clock in the morning. I thought that's what Christians did and I didn't realize students didn't do that normally. But um, And he went through one John with me and just took me through verse by verse, explaining that is the Bible, incredible. teaching me how to pray, teaching me how to actually begin to start applying the scriptures to my life. And so that was, it was really, really foundational. And then he but passed that, but, that back but, on. But Rick, that's amazing. He's He just naturally said, Rick, do you mind if we meet every morning? Yeah, we didn't even say that. He's just said, um, tomorrow morning, come to my room, seven o'clock, and we're going to read through the Bible. And I thought, okay, that, that, that's obviously what Christians do. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I got up at quarter to seven. And, um, and actually from there, what was lovely was my friend Tim, who'd, who'd taken me along, he took over from this other chap after three weeks. And Tim was two floors below me in my hall of residence. And so I would um, lean out of my window and I had like um, a dressing gown cord tied to a couple of ties. And I'd tie a mug to the end, lean out the window and bang it against his window to wake him up. So that by the time I went downstairs, the kettle had been put on. There was a cup of tea waiting for me. And we went through um, every day with Jesus for the rest of the term, every morning. And it was just, again, foundational. So, I mean, those, hugely foundational. Well, they taught and me how to, you know, the, yes. the, that it's so important to be in touch with God every morning to read the scriptures, to pray, to bring myself before God, to wait on him. So, so it was amazing. Well, you graduated. Uh, we had a wonderful year working together. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we went to Australia. We went to all so sorts just say, of places. I mean, you invited me to work with you. And that was an amazingly transformative time for me. Just I was going to work for Unilever and I uh, as a marketing manager and I you offered me a job and so I asked Unilever, could I delay the, the job a year? And they said yes, because they quite liked people doing different things. And I said, well, I'm going to be working for an evangelist. And they said, that's different. <laughs> so, <laughs> and so just doing that was amazing. And then going back after that year into industry, actually, it was a different, I was a different person because of that. Yeah, well, uh, you, it was a joy <laughs> to, uh, the Lord sends, sent people out in twos. Yeah. And I've always had, uh, and modeled that, yeah. that wherever I went, I would always go with someone. Yeah. 
and uh, because that was the season when Killy was with the children. Mm, mm. So we had some adventures. Yeah, we did. <laughs> you then did work for Unilever, but then later on you went forward for ordination. Yeah. So at when I was with um, Unilever, I was actually going to Holy Trinity Brompton as a church. And I was attending Nikki Gumbel, Nikki and Pippa Gumbel's, what they called a pastorate. It's a connect group, a midweek group. And Nikki one day said, um, we got to know each other a little bit, and he said, um, would you like to come and work here? And actually it was a moment where I think when I'd worked with you, I'd thought, I feel God's calling me to work for the church at some stage in my life. And working with you brought that forward. I thought it would be the end of a career in industry, but actually it was, it was clear it was going to be earlier. And so when Nikki said that, I thought, actually, I think this is the time. So I said, I th I'd like to, yes. And he went, oh, I'd better ask the vicar if that's OK. <laughs> and so, so he asked Sandy Miller and they, I joined the staff a few months later and then worked as a layperson for about three and a half years. I was leading the worship at HTB and then um, just really started exploring whether to get ordained or not. And I, I knew I needed training. I wanted to get theological training. I knew I wanted to base myself. I felt called to the Church of England and called to church leadership, but I wasn't sure if it was ordained or lay leadership. So I left that to the selection panel and they, uh, they decided, yes, you should be ordained. So I went to college in Wycliffe Hall in Oxford and then came back to Holy Trinity Brompton as a curate. So that's like an assistant pastor yes. for a few years. So that must have been a great time at Holy Trinity Brompton. But then a time came when you were, um, I don't want to say you were pushed out, but almost <laughs> like, Rick, it's time to birth yeah. something. Yeah. What happened then? So um, I got married just um, in the middle of that time to Louis. And so uh, she's an amazing, godly woman. And we, we were always praying. She was a missionary background, so she worked with YWAM for six or seven years. And so there was this, um, not just inside the house, this desire to kind of go, but also there was an encouragement from Sandy Miller and Nikki Gumbel to actually plant churches. And that meant to actually send a leader with a group of people from Holy Trinity to another place to revitalize an old church or to start a new one. And um, uh, for various reasons, 2004, we, we, you know, Sandy said, I think you, know, you need to go. And yes. th here's one that the Bishop of London has invited us to explore. And so we started exploring it. It was in the East End of London and Louis had prayed, <laughs> I'll blame her for this, Louis had prayed, um, I'll go anywhere in the world, but, but not East London. <laughs> so yes. yes. <laughs> and so, um, and I always had a, sl a little bit of a, I mean, I just didn't know East London at all. It always felt quite an alien space. And um, we started exploring it. And I just happened to be away a few days in America during that time. So we said, let's set apart this time. Let's pray, let's fast, let's ask the Lord. And when I remember coming back, we sat down at our kitchen table. We shared our journals. And I just remember weeping, both of us were weeping and just going, actually, God is calling us to go. Yes. <laughs> and, yes. and so we went and it was in 2005, January. It was an amazing, amazing thing. We had people who came who were in our midweek group who um, came with us. They moved house. There's some of them sold houses to come with us. And there are others in East London who came and joined as part of the team. And we went to St. Paul Shadwell, which was a church. They were about to close it. There were 12 people left in the congregation. And there were t a number of other Anglican churches quite close by. And the Bishop of London said, I don't want to close it. Um, I want to reopen it with a, um, a team. And so we went and, um, yeah, I guess the rest is history. And no, we yes. just saw God doing amazing things there. But what's so encouraging to hear, Rick, that people felt the calling yeah. like you and Louis did. Yeah. And actually uprooted. Yeah their families yeah. and relocated to another yeah. part yeah, yeah. of London. I mean, for me, it feels normal. Now, in fact, people are doing it more and more, not just around a city like London, but to different cities all around the country. And so I think it is a bit like the beginning of, in a way, my story, which is if you ask people, you, you just need to ask, you need to encourage people to step out. And I think God is stirring these things in our hearts already so that people are ready to respond to a call, to go and do something different, to go to another place, to sometimes have a fresh start, sometimes to, um, to move because of family circumstances. But actually there are people who are ready to move for the gospel to see something new happen in the kingdom yes. of God. 
And, um, it... and, and that is essential, Rick, because obviously uh, moving into a new church that needs regenerating, yeah. you, you still need a little bit of transfer growth yeah. to be able to st stabilise it, don't you? Yeah, so the way I see it is that most churches in the Church of England, you'd, when there's a vacancy, you, you appoint someone through interviews to come and lead that church. But it's a really difficult thing if that church is really struggling. And so, and doesn't have the well, they don't have the resources, power, power the resources. people, the leaders yes. to, to do things. And so, you're putting a lot of pressure on one person or a family. And what this is doing is simply saying, well, if you work out with with the permission or the go ahead of that parish church, the receiving church, to say, let's have a partnership between a leader who brings a group of people with them. Th they're partnering with the existing group, and it might be a very small group, but they're saying, actually, yes, we want to see this new new thing. And um, having a group of people will catalyze change. It will add momentum to what people want to see. And you know, it can take you know, five, 10 years to grow the church by 50 people. Yes. But if 50 people join you on day one, well, that will accelerate your growth straight away. How long were you and Louis at St Paul's? So almost 11 years. 11 years. And, and during that time, yeah. I know you planted other congregations and yeah. we'll touch on that in a minute. But during that time, when you arrived at the church, how many members were there? So at, at there, St. Were, Paul's? there were 12 people there when we arrived. And you took how many people with so you? So we took 20 who moved house from West London. And then 80 people joined us from other places. Now, I would actually say that's probably too many in yes. retrospect because... If you've got so many coming day one, that means there's not a job for everyone. Yep. And so you've got some people just, their experience is sitting down, receiving, sure. and not doing anything. And so I'd say a smaller group's great, but still but, it but needs to be big enough. at that time, that's what, that's what it was. That's and what it was. we couldn't control that. And, no. and actually they were still going to, they, they were going to Holy Trinity Brompton. Yeah. So they were crossing London to go there. So their yes. commute to church yeah, it was, make... well, it, it took 35, 40 minutes yes. off their journey. So, so they were happy. it wasn't their local church. No. no. But what happened was that people who were going across town then started saying, actually, I'm going to go to a more local church, which yeah. is St Paul's. And so we started to, um, so that was with, you know, 100. We have we got about two thirds of people coming at any one time because people come sure. twice, three times a month, and then the church began to start growing as yes. we did evangelism, as we did mission. Yes. Um, I remember um, you coming over and you gave us some advice about Christmas. Yes. And you said, um, I said, well, what should we do for a Christmas evangelistic service? And you said, don't just have one Christmas evangelistic service. Have lots, you know, have. Yeah. There are lots of ice cream flavors. That's Let's right. have something for some people, something for someone else, and something for other people. And so, just being able to say, ah, actually, it's quite an eye opener. You did, there are so many opportunities you can create yes. with something like Christmas, that um, uh, we then said, well, let's do something in the morning and evening on a Sunday before, and then a number of events for different groups of people. And it was, uh, it was simple, yes. obvious. But we didn't see it at the time. We needed yes. someone from outside to say, just, uh, just you know, this is this is what you can do. And so we well, did it. I, well, <laughs> we, we all need, don't we, Rick? Insight and yeah. foresight. We just need to see things differently. Yes. But the church flourished. Yeah, it grew. Because you had, you had that initial vibrant congregation that was very intentional in evangelism. Yeah. And it grew and grew and grew. Yeah. Now, out of that, yeah. how many other congregations did you then birth? Well, um, inside the church, we, we, we planted congregations. So we had three congregations regularly. And then inside the parish, we actually started, we did some door knocking around the parish. And we realised, I realised, because I did a lot of it, that there were some people who were interested in faith who were never going to come to our church building. So just like the incarnation, we said, well, actually, we need to go to them. We can't expect them always to come to us. So let's. Yes. What are the things we could do? So we had something in the local pub. We had, you know, on a Wednesday night, there was a, in the upper room of the pub, there was a group of people who met there. Something on the estate where there's an estate next to the church, but people never came across a kind of a main road to go to the church. That was in. So let's go there, and someone set up a group there. So we had a number of different things happening inside the parish. But then we had the opportunity then actually four times over the next few years to be able to do what happened at St Paul's, which was to send a leader and a group of people to another church to bring that back to life. And there were um, two churches that were close to closure. Um, 
we were able to send a leader and a team to those two churches. And then another one, the actual vicar said, we're rebuilding this church. Would you like to, um, we're a more liberal Catholic church. Would you like to do something a bit more of your flavor there? And so we sent a team there. And then we sent a team to a, um, to an evening service, to start an evening service in another church where they had tried to do that, but just couldn't get the momentum to do it. So again, adding momentum sure. to them to be able to something. And so regenerating. Yeah, and, and so there are four churches that are flourishing, five churches that are flourishing in that place that weren't before. So it's, it's an amazing privilege to see that happen. Absolutely. Mm. Now, y you was, uh, then made the Bishop of Islington. When yeah. When did that happen? That was 2015. So the bit I was already working a little bit with the Bishop of London as his advisor for church planting. I thought that meant I was advising him, but he sent me out to advise other people about yes. some of the stuff that we'd learnt. I'd learnt a lot from Holy Trinity Brompton. And so just sharing that experience with others um, around the country. And he said, um, I think you need to do this on a larger scale. So he, um, first of all, appointed me as his, you know, just doing a bit more in the diocese. Uh, developing the strategy for church planting of all kinds, not just that style, but many different kinds of church planting. And then in 2015, he said, um, after a year of reviving a dormant or a sea, um, the Sea of Islington, the, last, the first Bishop of Islington had died in 1923, and there'd been no bishop since then. So in 2015, he appointed me as the Bishop of Islington to revive, to bring the sea out of abeyance. That's the kind of technical term. Yes. <laughs> As I became Bishop of Islington with a special remit to plant churches in London Diocese and then be available nationally to support church yes. planting in the Church of England. So it's like a commission. Yeah. I mean, which is a wonderful yeah, commission amazing. to have. And uh, the, the parish is the whole nation. Well, it's, a, it's an amazing role. I mean, for a bishop, I get all the fun stuff. <laughs> so, you know, to, to care for churches is a wonderful, wonderful privilege. And that's one of the things that church, uh, bishops have is to pastor the pastors. Um, my role is to pastor the pastors who are just about to become pastors. And yes. so to, uh, to help plant new churches, to identify and train church planters. And then as soon as they've planted that church, they then come under the local authority of the, of the local of bishop. Of course, yes. And so, um, and that's, I always think when, you know, if there are problems in churches, it's after they've started. So I get all the fun and then the other yeah. bishops get all the challenges. So. But the, the, one of the things I've always uh, admired about you, Rick, and I've tried myself, is just to keep learning, keep yeah, learning, absolutely. keep learning. Absolutely. And while you're doing all this, you did a doctorate. <laughs> and what did you do that on? Yeah, so I, uh, when I became a bishop, I just thought, actually, I want, I've got maybe 15, 20 years of work ahead of me. And so I thought, I need to do more reading, more writing, more thinking about this, you know, fueling this next part of the journey. And so um, I thought I needed to do this in a structured way because I'm, I'm just, I'm, I can't do it on my own. I haven't got the motivation to do that. And so I um, was invited to do a, a doctor of ministry through Asbury Seminary in the States. And I did it with three other friends um, from England, and um, I did it on, you know, you're asked to, invited to do a, a research dissertation on a particular aspect of what you're doing at the moment. And so I did it on resource churches, which was um, a new thing in the Church of England. It's something I'd been uh, particularly involved with encouraging and, and developing. And so I, I basically looked at what are the things that stop a resource church doing what it's supposed to do? which yes. basically a resource church is a church that plants churches again and again and again and again. Not every church is called to do that, but resource churches have almost like a calling to do that. And so it's just beginning to say, uh, what's the theology of this? What's the, um, what's the, what does the Bible have to say about this? What are the, what's the history in England of these things? And then just beginning to say, well, how, how does this work out in practice and how sure. can we encourage it a bit more? So. I wrote, wrote a, yes, a dissertation you did. and then, you, oh, well, look, you, there we go. There we <laughs> are, resource churches. So some of your dissertation yeah. came out into this yes. as yeah, a that's right. distillation. Yeah. Um, so I first started learning to write with you, John. <laughs> yes, I know. We, we, had, we kind of um, well, well, we had supported your writing. But there was um, a couple of nights we worked <laughs> through the nights, particularly when we worked on one Christmas book. That's right. All through the night. Well, I, I, know. I did a bit of that with this book. Yes, <laughs> so. well done. So, OK, the thing, Rick, I know, uh, yes, you are a bishop in the Church of England, Bishop of Islington, 
but you're a very kingdom person. It's about the kingdom of yeah. Jesus. Yeah. And many of these principles are not just applicable to the Church of England, they're applicable in any denomination. Absolutely, absolutely. So the thing about the church, God has called the church to be a dynamic expression of the people of God, to be that, um, or, or, you know, it's the new family of God, to, to invite people to join the family of God, to follow Jesus. And so you've got those local expressions everywhere. And some people in established denominations like the Church of England might think, oh, actually we've finished church planting because we've got all the parishes, we've got enough churches. The problem is that as soon as you make the church static, it begins to lose momentum, lose its missional zeal. It is it's in danger of that. And um, churches that are church planting churches, um, all the evidence says that when a church is planted, it, it creates new opportunities for evangelism. So more people hear the gospel in new churches than in existing churches. It also helps the existing churches to, um, it almost challenges them to new um, new zeal to say we want to be like that we want to um, be challenged in that way as well and so it stirs them up too so church planting is actually good for denominations it's good for networks of churches it's good for individual churches and as soon as we see that happening more people hear the gospel more people get reached with the gospel more people respond to the gospel and so it is a missional activity I, I bring it back to um, Matthew chapter 8 uh, so 28 verse 19 and 20 where Jesus says go into the world make disciples and uh, baptize them in the name of the Father Son and the Holy Spirit and teach them to obey everything I've commanded you and surely I'll be with them to the very end of the age now what Jesus is talking about is not just about going which we need to go and go and share the gospel not just about making disciples mm -hmm. which is part of that first part of that verse but also to baptize and teach Yes. Baptise and teach, the it's hap that's a church activity. It's like an integration. So it is. It's yes. both evangelism and church together. And combine those two things and you've got church planting in a nutshell. Yes. Now, so, OK, just to pick up on something you said there, Rick, uh, planting new churches, there's a new vibrancy and the gospel's being preached yeah. in a way that's not being preached. Well, it's, it is. It needs to continue to be preached in the other place. I know. Why do you think in the... <sighs> The gospel, you know, what is it that's hindering most existing churches? That's a really good question. So, uh, from preaching the gospel? Preaching the gospel, evangelism, anything. So, I think um, the first thing that comes to mind is, you know, um, Ephesians um, 4, Paul talks about the fivefold ministries apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, evangelists. And um, I think the challenge there is that in a st static church, we, we tend to focus on pastor teachers. Who's going to pastor the flock? Who's going to teach you know, the, the, the faith to those who are in church? But um, what you, and, and actually that is something which we've recruited in the Church of England. You know, we're, we're good at recruiting pastor teachers. But evangelists, actually they're the key to growing the church. We, um, we haven't emphasised that enough. And so I, I can only speak in the Church of England, but it's, it's easy to get caught up in teaching and caught up in pastoring that we lose that essential gift. And uh, the people who have, are called to be, I mean, we're all called to do um, evangelism, but there are some who are set apart or called to be evangelists. And so who are those people? We need to identify them and release them and encourage them. But then the apostles and the prophets, and the prophets today, they might be, and there's a whole range of different ways of thinking about that, but the people who speak out the word of God, both in society, but to the church, to challenge the church. And apostles, the apostolic, is that impulse to go out and to start new churches, start new ministries. And so it's very easy, I think, to answer your question, to get caught up in two of the five of those key callings of the church to have these people set apart for ministry pastors and teachers, essential they are, but to not affirm the other ministries that God has raised up in the church. And so I think that can be, uh, well, when we start thinking of the church in those ways, I think it challenges us to start thinking, who are the evangelists? Where is evangelism happening? Is there an opportunity? You know, Church of England, we have parishes, um, but actually lots of churches have almost like a reach. 
different denominations. What's your reach? Who, how are you reaching beyond the people who are just inside the walls of your church? How can you actually step outside that and begin to say, how can we encourage members to reach out to their neighbours and friends? How can we uh, begin to start seeing the, you know, the way local community works and speak the gospel into those contexts and so on? So that's, that's beginning to start saying, actually, can we invite those people to us or can we go and start something amongst them? And that's all, that's the way, there's just so many opportunities. So even just asking the question begins to start changing that mindset. Yes. There are some leaders um, who, by the grace of God, are able to grow churches. Mm. And there are some leaders who don't have that ability or gifting to do that. Yeah, so I think there there are a few things to say into that. So the first thing is that there is obviously some church leaders can help others yes but they've got to want to be helped yes and there are all kinds of dynamics in there when people when there's jealousy or um different slightly different understandings of scripture so that there are kind of barriers i think it's a real shame because there is so much if you have that posture of learning of saying actually i want to grow i want to learn i want to be as as good as we can be and and here's something which i think i don't know if this is a british thing or but to actually ask for help Yes. People just don't ask for help. So um, we did this survey around our church and said, look, if you'd like to be revitalised by another church, just we would love to see, see if that's the case. And there were actually some churches who said, yes, we would like this. And so that obviously gave us a, an sure. opportunity to link those up. But there are many churches, I guess, that I'd love to think, oh, I'd love you to say yes, because you're not going to be able to do it on your own. Yes. It's about uh, d- l- making Christ known. It's about people being set free, it's about people encountering the living God in their lives and, and just being transformed. And so, um, you know, that that to me is a transforming factor. And in my experience, when people look at each other and they notice all the differences, that's when we get problems. Yeah. Whereas if we're facing outwards to the mission field, then actually our differences be- become our strengths. And actually then, I, then I'm able to say, wow, We've got surplus here. Would you like some of that? Sure. And actually, you're doing something. Can I learn from you? And that, that approach is so different because we're not just going, oh, I, you're different to me. I don't want to have anything to do with you. Here's the mission. Let's do this together. And um, I need you because you're different to me. We can reach more people together than we can apart. Absolutely. Survive and thrive <laughs> it's it's a joy to talk to you rick thank you for all that you oh. d- are doing thank you for this wonderful resource i i've just found it inspirational i mean i i love reading and engaging and i highly recommend this rick thank you, thank you so much for thank joining you for having us me on facing the camera oh, thanks john i hope that's inspired you a uh, great encouragement a reminder that jesus is the cornerstone of the church and he wants us to prepare his bride for his return. I hope this has encouraged you. Thank you for joining us on Facing the Canon. Please join us again.